Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to the new normal for spirit sellers. It's our fifth installment uh, of a six part series. Uh, we're talking about everything that's important to the retail industry, retail liquor industry in particular, coming through the COVID environment and coming out the other side uh, to see what everything looks like. We've got, uh, we've got a great show today where we're gonna focus on the regulatory aspect of things. I think it's hugely important. Um, we'll introduce Jared Dieterle in just a few minutes um, and walk through some of what he has to bring to the table. Um, we're presenting this from Distillery 291. Uh, along with our partners LibDib. I'll introduce Cheryl Dersey, the CEO of LibDib in just a second. I do want to introduce my partners in crime here at 291. There's Michael Myers, our founding distiller and CEO. And there's Philip with his hat on, Raleigh. He's our VP of Business Development. Awesome. Um, so I'm, my name, I forgot that part. My name is Murray Aronson. I'm the CFO of Distillery 291. Uh, today, like I said, we're going to talk about liquor regulations. I'm going to unmute Cheryl so she can say hello and introduce herself, and then we'll talk to Jarrett and get into things. Hi, can you hear me? All good? Can hear you. Good yes. to go. Hi. Hi, Murray. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you again this week. Um, I'm with uh, LibDib. We are a, we're a distributor in six states. We do things a little bit differently in that we support the small producers. However, since we're talking about regulations, I will firmly state we are very, very compliant. Um, all of our shipments go through all of the right processes, and um, but we uh, allow anybody distribution in any of the states that we operate in. So glad to be here as always. Um, we're great to be partnered with our the fine folks from 291 um, and appreciate, appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, I'm gonna say a few introductory words about Jarrett. Uh, he is an alcohol policy expert at R Street, um, but I've got a formal uh, introduction for him so I can give him all his props. And he goes by formally in the introduction at C Jarrett Dieterle. Um, and I'm sitting next to J Michael Myers. So we, we can play that game. Uh, Jarrett Dieterle is an alcohol policy expert at the R Street Institute think tank and the editor of drinksreform.org a website and newsletter dedicated to tracking and analyzing alcohol reform efforts across the country. He is also a contributing drinks writer to the Richmond Times Dispatch and has written about spirits, booze history, and questionable regulations for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Liquor.com, Vine Pair, and NPR's The Salt. This September, his cocktail book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, I love that title, which provides a humor, uh, humorous tour of America's craziest alcohol laws will be published by Artisan Books. He lives in Richmond, Virginia. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna unmute Jarrett. I said that and then I lost him in the little queue. There he is. Okay. You are unmuted, Jarrett. Um, so with that formal introduction in hand, I'd like you to maybe uh, kind of do it a little more informally. Talk to us a little bit about R Street, what, what, the, uh, what the, uh, the organization does, what your role is within it, and just kind of give us background on your involvement in the alcohol industry overall and, and walk us through everything. Yeah, well, thank you very, very much for having me, first of all. Um, I think that need to be doing this uh, uh, event hosted by a distillery. A lot of uh, people that talk about this stuff are kind of policy wonk nerd types like myself, um, uh, often in DC. So it's nice that uh, there's, uh, there's some people that are actually out in the field talking about these issues. But yeah, uh, I um, uh, work and, and study uh, uh, alcohol regulations, uh, work on them and study them um, at, at the R Street Institute. We're a, a nonpartisan research organization um, and we do a whole host of, of different topics, but one of them is uh, alcohol policy and talk about the ways that it can be uh, improved and some of the laws could be updated and uh, how uh, we could get to a, a place that helps both uh, entrepreneurial spirit makers and, and consumers and, and the other stakeholders in the industry uh, to be able to do what they do best without uh, undue interference, uh, basically. And so we, uh, we do, that can go a lot of different ways, of course. There's uh, many 
uh, many types of alcohol laws uh, at, at the state and local level, and even, of course, a few at the federal level. Uh, but uh, recently, it's been definitely uh, uh, subsumed with uh, a lot of work on how uh, COVID-19 is uh, upending things and, and changing things very, very quickly. Uh, it's amazing. It is an area of the law that, uh, for, for a large part, has not changed a ton compared to some other areas of, of uh, our legal system in the last, uh, you know, 80 years. But uh, it's... Uh, there's definitely some, some opportunities for change, I think, on the horizon, which I'm, I'm assuming we're going to talk about today. So, but that's broadly what we do and, uh, and what I study. So, Awesome. Yeah, so um, we are going to talk about that today. And so let's start with just that. Let's start with the big picture um, and talk about what you think is happening direct, directionally and how much momentum there might be, meaning are we going to see drastic changes? Are we going to see more just temporary changes? Are we going to see incremental changes? But what do you, what do you think the impact is on COVID directionally for the industry? Yeah, I think right now um, there's, there's some big picture changes going on. And I think the key will be whether they're temporary or not. Um, you know, I, I, definitely they're not small scale stuff. Um, you know, we have uh, many more states allowing uh, things like to go cocktails, uh, delivery of cocktails, even some places have uh, at least started considering relaxing things like open container laws. Uh, so definitely big changes, um, but the import of them will depend uh, and, and kind of the, the staying power of them will very much depend on whether we move from this emergency order paradigm we're in now to more of this stuff actually being locked in, probably via legislation uh, in the states. Right now, it's, it's very easy for a governor in a state during this emergency to kind of the wave of his pen, I, I change a whole host of stuff temporarily. Uh, governors are granted a lot of uh, broad powers, emergency powers, understandably, uh, when, when kind of different kinds of crises arise. Um, and, and this one lent itself very well to rethinking how people were generally accessing goods and services and made things like delivery very important. And because uh, delivery of alcohol has been something that's not as widespread as uh, other products that we get at our doors. It, it really lent, lent itself to kind of that emergency uh, waiver uh, treatment. And so the question now is, you know, whether, whether it's going to stay around. And usually that requires uh, more work by uh, state legislatures to actually pass stuff uh, into law uh, and, and kind of give it that permanent, uh, permanent durability. So I think that's kind of the key thing to watch going forward. Um, and and it, it's unfortunately, it's created probably a lot of uncertainty for the licensees and, and the stakeholders in the industry right now, because a lot of things are temporary. Are they going to keep going? Are they not? When are they going to end? Uh, you know, the, the reopening phases have started. Some governors have started kind of, uh, you know, flexing the, their muscles to their broadest extent that they can and started extending these things for longer. And, and, and depends on, you know, different states, some governors can, can probably keep it up longer than, than others will be able to. But uh, there, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how lasting this will be. But, but I do think that it's definitely been significant, uh, uh, big scale uh, changes that we're seeing. Uh, it, it really unlike we've seen in recent times in the alcohol landscape. And I'd be glad to dive in a little bit to some of the uh, specific uh, uh, states and changes that, that we're seeing in some of the states that are now trying to contemplate whether whether they want to make some of these reforms permanent as well. Yeah, that'd be great. And we will obviously peel back the onion here. Just kind of stay in high level for one more question. You know, two things that kind of strike me when you take a look at the alcohol industry and all the regulations is one, the lack of uniformity and two, the extent of the regulations. So I, so I wondered if you could speak to both of those. Do you think because COVID is something that is hitting, obviously, the world, but from a U.S. perspective, the entire nation. Do you think that leads us towards more uniformity? And do you think the fact that we've got uh, governors kind of taking the, taking the reins off a little bit, do you think that leads us to more of a deregulatory kind of direction? Yeah, so that, that's always a, kind of the one uh, great question in, in alcohol world. Um, it's one of the biggest industries that's uh, still predominantly regulated, of course, as, as everyone on this call knows, um, at, at the state and local or, or sub-national level. Uh, that's where the, the locus of, of the regulation is. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the, the, it, it, any, everyone always wonders, and people that are, that are uh, abroad always ask me why we have such a piecemeal system of, uh, of alcohol regulation compared to some other industries. And, and of course, the answer to that is, is, is it, that it is a direct heritage of our 
prohibition uh, history. Uh, and, you know, the federal government decided to uh, get out of the booze business uh, in uh, the 21st Amendment. And uh, really, if you read the text of it, transferred a lot of its powers to the states and, and local governments. So we still had things like dry states uh, and dry counties that we still have actually uh, in our post-prohibition landscape. Um, and a lot of the structures we have today were developed during that time. Um, and so it's created this hodgepodge. And I do think that, um, you know, there, there may be a move towards more uniformity with things like interstate uh, shipment. Uh, we can get into that a little bit more. Um, there's also been some uh, recent litigation that, that uh, at the Supreme Court level that, that could have an impact there. Um, that, uh, but, but it's going to need multiple states to kind of opt into that kind of uh, uh, approach and want to have reciprocal shipping agreements with other states, for example, to start creating more of that uniformity. Uh, because, you know, what we're seeing now, again, it's just, it's, it's state governors and they can, you know, very often, uh, or even legislation and state legislatures can very often allow things like an in-state uh, Colorado distillery, such as 291, to be able to uh, ship to an in-state Colorado resident. But things get tricky if you're then trying to ship out to me in Virginia, for example. Um, and, and, and it would need Virginia and Colorado to kind of have a reciprocal agreement, for example, for, for shipping. So my hope is that we will move more towards that and we'll have things like that. I would like to be able to easily order a 291 whiskey and, uh, you know, my favorite craft uh, beers from, uh, you know, my, my home state of Michigan, just as, as two examples. Uh, but that's, uh, that's hard to do right now. And so uh, I, there may be more of a push towards that, but the easiest low hanging fruit is going to probably still be uh, intrastate stuff, at least I think for the immediate future. Okay, that makes sense. And so let's, uh, I do want to circle back to the interstate, but let's start intrastate as you suggested. But let's talk about deliveries from an intrastate standpoint. Um, where do you see the direction of that going? How likely are we to see changes? And maybe talk about the, you know, a couple of the elements involved there, because some of the deliveries are happening through third parties, some are not. What, what do you see happening on that front? Yeah, well, and as people know, um, many states have allowed uh, some form of alcohol delivery, whether it's from restaurants or retailers uh, during, uh, you know, liquor stores during uh, the, the pandemic. And I, I think it's going to be hard to fully put the toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, you know, consumers, uh, we live in a world where people are very used to uh, getting pretty much every product at their door within one or two days, for example, from, from Amazon Prime. Um, and in some cases, you know, you can get stuff within the hour. Uh, it is amazing how, how quickly that, that can happen. But uh, th that's not always the case with, with alcohol, depending on where you live. Uh, some cities have on-demand uh, alcohol delivery from uh, folks like, you know, Drizzly or Instacart with your groceries and other ones don't, don't have that. Um, and so, uh, but now that more people have tasted that and have kind of experienced that, I think that there probably will be consumer interest uh, in some form of a continuing. And then the question is going to be, what does that look like? Uh, and, and I think already we're seeing um, a couple of models of what it, uh, what it could look like. Um, there may be some limited uh, uh, deliveries, uh, allowance for deliveries from producers, uh, distilleries and breweries uh, and wineries kind of doing on-demand local uh, livery, delivery. Um, there, uh, of course, a lot of what we're seeing is, is restaurant retail uh, level uh, delivery. So allowing restaurants to sell you know, cocktails to go you can get a margarita and uh, um, you know some kind of a to-go version. Um, we've seen a couple of uh, bills popping up in, in states to kind of per make permanent uh, emergency orders that have allowed that. And then I think we're going to continue to see, which was already something that was starting to percolate pre-COVID, we're going to see uh, more bills and more push for delivery from retail stores or grocery stores of, of beer or hard spirits. Uh, or wine. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, it, it will all be different levels and different types of licensees uh, that, that will uh, be kind of pushed in different states. It's going to depend on what they already allow and what they could allow, uh, what they, there's the political uh, uh, will and ability to do in, in certain states. Um, and then there's also going to be kind of uh, different trends to watch for. I think uh, one question that's going to increasingly uh, assert itself is who's doing the deliveries? Is it going to be uh, the employees of uh, a restaurant? Is a restaurant going to have, more restaurants going to have delivery uh, employees, um, maybe in the same way that some pizza restaurants do, for example? Is that very scalable? Is every restaurant going to be able to do that and be able to have that infrastructure in place? Um, or maybe would third-party delivery services kind of step in, into that fold there? 
um, you know, the, again, the Drizzlies, the Amazons, the, the Instacarts, uh, DoorDash of the world um, to kind of provide that infrastructure. Um, and, and already there's been some state bills that have gone one way and some, some the other uh, with that. So we're already seeing that uh, assert itself and will become an increasing issue. Um, and then kind of the last, I think, trend to, to watch, again, goes a little bit back to the permanency question, but a couple of, of the bills that have uh, popped up to um, quote unquote, extend or make permanent these emergency orders really are not permanent. They're just, uh, they might have a sunset provision after, you know, 2022, 2023. Uh, I think the intent is to kind of have a little bit of a pilot uh, 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 experience and see if that works or if it doesn't and then maybe extend it. Uh, but, but that's going to be another uh, debate that kind of uh, asserts itself um, in, in the coming, uh, in, in the coming uh, weeks. And, and, and so, and, and then a, a kind of, I guess, maybe one more uh, feature to watch is going to be the continued uh, discussion over, um, you know, ID uh, checking and compliance of delivery orders. Uh, that's often something that you hear about uh, from kind of the people that are skeptical of delivery or uh, worried that it would lead to, you know, access, uh, underage access to alcohol. There's been a couple anecdotal reports that uh, in the chaos of, of COVID and all these new restaurants and new services, uh, including alcohol delivery instead of, instead of just grocery delivery, that there has been some deliveries made to uh, underage people. So there, there's going to be increasing uh, discussion about um, compliance around ID checks and exactly what that uh, entails. And, and uh, the, the companies involved obviously have a lot of opinions on that uh, because it, it involves their format, uh, kind of their protocols and uh, whether it's, you know, third party or whether it's restaurants or, or uh, stores themselves doing it, there's going to be a lot of discussion on what that compliance looks like. So th those are kind of the different ways and different changes that, that uh, are variants, I guess, if you will, of, of the different bills that could be out there and the different models. But uh, it's all going to be a, a version of that in the states that try to pursue that, uh, pursue this. And those are going to be the debates that the policymakers are having and the stakeholders. Yeah, so you covered a ton of information in there. I want to. Yeah, um, probably too much. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. I think those are, you know, great hot button issues. So let's try to dig a little yeah. bit deeper on some of them. So I mean, one of the things I'm trying to get a beat on or, or help the industry, you know, as we're having this discussion is, you know, what are the leading indicators and how can you get a sense of what's going to happen or what's not going to happen? So I would say, and please, you know, steer me or correct me if I'm wrong, that if you're going to see positive movement in legislation, you're going to have to see public opinion kind of steering it that way. Um, on the flip side, if you're going to see pushback on legislation, you're going to have to have more of those anecdotal data points that say, for example, underage drinking, you know, is an issue if we're doing more deliveries like that. So do you have a sense of kind of where momentum is building? Have we seen public opinion kind of taking hold in a way that can lead in a legislative direction? Yeah. You know, and, and, and the flip side, what have we seen on the, you know, data points as far as underage drinking or, or similar sorts of pushback points? Yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen a couple of, I don't think anything exhaustive has been done yet because this is all so new, but there's been more kind of, I've seen some state level polls that, you know, I don't know how comprehensive or not they are, that, uh, you know, people are in favor of extending, for example, emergency orders or, uh, for delivery uh, around alcohol. You know, again, I think that, I think there's definitely interest in that. I think that, yes, more robust data sets will hopefully come out and, and give us more information on that. But I think that I would be surprised if there wasn't a lot of consumer interest in some form of more to go in delivery alcohol. Um, so I, I think that, that there definitely will be the interest and in, in the public opinion there to spur some change. Uh, the uh, question will be is, is to what extent people are still concerned about things like underage drinking, uh, as you mentioned, or, or other potential drawbacks of, of alcohol. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, that, it's going to, it's really going to depend. I mean, again, right now it's easy to find some, um, you know, limited case studies that have found some compliance issues, but I think that it'll really depend going forward how much uh, the, the people doing the deliveries are able to show or, or find a, a system for compliance. And some of them I think already have great systems for compliance, it, it should be clear. Um, but, but, but finding a model that, uh, that makes sense and that really isn't uh, any different than if you buy it in store. So I think that one of the things that often can 
happen in this debate is, you know, people will uh, be able to find some, you know, anecdotal examples of an underage person getting alcohol from, from a delivery, um, which, you know, clearly has happened uh, before. And, and again, there's some stories uh, in the media about that now. Uh, but you also, it's, it's not just that it's happening that's remarkable. It's kind of the question would be to what extent is it happening compared to in-store purchases or in-restaurant purchases? Um, and obviously there's not perfect compliance in those situations either. Um, I think probably most people on, on this call have had the experience of going into like a, a gas station or something near a college campus um, that is not super rigorous about uh, checking IDs, right? Uh, and, uh, and so that, that happens, it's an industry-wide issue, uh, creating compliance anytime you have a rule like that. And I think that the key will be, is there a delta, is there a difference between delivery in terms of compliance and is there one a diff uh, versus in-store? And so I think that, you know, whether that question will determine whether public opinion kind of shifts one way or other on, on, on the ID issue in particular. But as far as the interest in, in alcohol delivery, I, uh, you know, again, there's, there's been early indication that people like it. And I think that that makes a lot of sense just because so much of our economy allows some form of direct uh, on-demand shipment of goods or, or delivery of goods. So um, it, it's still early to tell and we'll know a lot more in I think a year where, where those things end up. But I think the interest is there and it's just going to be what, what model uh, uh, is, is kind of used or, or pushed forward that, that can get buy-in from enough people. Okay, I want to, uh, before I ask you to kind of look at some examples or, you know, who's leading from a state by state basis, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, cocktails to go that you referenced earlier, right, that we're seeing from bars and restaurants um, as well. So what, what do you see happening there? And in particular, I'm curious what your thoughts are vis-a-vis you know, open container laws, how those have been viewed in the past and how you think they're being viewed at this point in time? Yeah, yeah, those are, those are good questions. Um, I mean, just about the, the uh, cocktail to go issue in particular, I mean, I think that it was just a, a case of necessity that led at least, you know, originally to a lot of these emergency orders because people are very used to going to a restaurant and they get alcohol often when they're there. Restaurants depend tremendously on profit margins from alcohol. It's a well-known, uh, 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 reality. If you work in the restaurant industry, uh, they, they have some of the uh, largest margins for alcohol, so it can often help uh, support their food service, even in some cases. Uh, so when when that was cut off, and, and all of a sudden the only thing you could get from a restaurant was a hamburger, and but not a a, a margarita with it, for example. Uh, I think that it just had to be done in, in an effort to help uh, sustain the restaurant industry uh, as much as possible during the pandemic. Uh, this obviously was uh, the pandemic was most uh, uh, hurtful towards uh, kind of gathering oriented businesses that depend on people being on on premise, right? So um, I think that it, it's clear why it happened. I think now again that it's happened, people kind of wonder why they always couldn't get a mojito from their uh, favorite restaurant up the street uh, along with uh, their take home dinner of, uh, you know, wh whatever it might be. Um, so I think it makes sense that, that more states are contemplating that uh, a lot of the same issues we've talked about will arise with uh, to-go cocktails versus sealed containers. There's other issues that can arise. You know, what does the container look like, right? I mean, that's obvious. Uh, that would be a kind of a, a, an issue that a lot of people would get real uh, uh, locked in on uh, debating. Some states, you know, say that you can't have a, a straw hole anywhere uh, uh, in, in the container. Uh, some say no plastic bags, only, um, you know, uh, like lidded containers. Um, I think Colorado might have done that for a while under its emergency orders. Um, uh, other places like Washington, D.C., for example, some of the most prominent cocktail bars in D.C. are, you know, proudly serving their cocktails in plastic bags now, right? So I think that that's one variant of that that will be debated. But I think, you know, like beer growlers, for example, and like, uh, you know, refillable uh, products from producers, I think probably that's something that's fixable technologically wise. There will be containers that are really good for to-go cocktails, I think, in our, in our future. So I think that that will largely sort itself out. Uh, and then, you know, the question that you alluded to is where do people then drink their to-go uh, cocktail? Uh, they can go home now, obviously, um, but will there be a push to relax uh, some form of uh, public drinking or an easing of uh, open container laws? I think that uh, that's been lost a little bit in all of this. It's not been uh, kind of really uh, uh, hot reform that everyone's pushing. Delivery obviously is the big topic du jour, but I think that 
more people are starting to talk about open container laws. Um, we, we really, for a while there, um, and, and things are a little bit, now that they're opening up, it might be different, but you know, for a while in a lot of states, we had de facto open container uh, allowances during uh, COVID. I know in my state of Virginia, if you went to a park in downtown Richmond, uh, you know, I saw people drinking everywhere just openly and that I did not see that pre-COVID and no policeman cared whatsoever. Uh, so we, for a little while, had uh, kind of de facto open container laws. So if people try to continue bringing a beer to a park and then start, start getting citations for it, uh, once we're back in our uh, back in uh, normal uh, status, whenever that may be, um, maybe that could uh, push more people to start talking about that. There's been some limited stuff I've seen. So for example, Michigan, uh, one of their bills um, is, uh, has a provision that would allow social districts. Um, social districts are just a, a fancy word for kind of a limited designated area in a municipality where you can have open uh, beverage. Uh, containers outside. Oftentimes it'll be on like a, a walkable area of the downtown uh, and you need to often purchase your uh, drinks say from a, a restaurant or a distillery that's down there. Um, you can't just bring your own beer from home. So, so there's limited versions of relaxing open container laws and I think we may see more of that. We were seeing more of that before the pandemic and everyone associates open container laws with New Orleans and Las Vegas, you know, the strip downtown these wild crazy places. But you know, I always like to tell people like India, India, uh, Indianapolis and Erie, Pennsylvania have open container laws. You know, it, it's a uh, <laughs> it's, it's a thing that's spreading to more places, and it's not just uh, party cities. And it's something that more more places are considering just as a business development technique, as a tourist attraction, uh, whatever it might be. Savannah, Georgia is another one that famously has a, a limited open container uh, 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 district. So. Um, yeah, I think that that's, again, something that uh, people will kind of question why they can't keep doing something that didn't seem to be having particular harm to anyone. Um, there's other laws that can control, you know, people are drinking too much and being too loud, for example. There's noise ordinances. There's other things, I think, that can control for some of, for some of the negative potential effects. Uh, but, but yeah, it's something to keep an eye on. People may, we may be, you know, down the road, we might come to a point where we're having to go margaritas and then we can go drink them in a park nearby. I don't know. It won't happen overnight, but it's possible. No. So, uh, so you mentioned a couple different places. You mentioned your home state of Virginia, you mentioned Michigan um, and, uh, and I'll get to uh, questions from the group as well, but I wanted to see if you wanted to, you know, point out any other activities that you see in particular states that you think are noteworthy. If you see in states who are kind of, you know, assuming leadership roles or pushing the envelope a little bit more than the other states? Yeah, well, I mean, Colorado is, is one. I mean, we should talk about a, um, they had a pretty robust uh, emergency order from uh, Governor Polis out there. Um, and there's now a, a bill that would allow restaurants and on-premise licensees to sell to go or do delivery uh, in Colorado. Currently, that would only extend it through 2022. So there you go with the uh, a version that just extends. It's not permanent yet. This obviously can be amended as it works, it way, works its way through the legislature. Uh, currently, it uh, uh, allows only employees of the licensees to do delivery, uh, not third party uh, deliveries. So again, there you go, another uh, thing that we mentioned um, uh, to watch uh, that the Colorado uh, version doesn't allow that right now. Um, there's other states that uh, you know have, have gone the other way. Louisiana actually is interesting. They passed uh, uh, an alcohol delivery bill last year, pre-COVID. Uh, and they limited it only to employees. Um, and they've actually recently uh, changed that to allow third party deliveries um, so during uh, COVID. Um, I don't, it wasn't because of COVID, but that maybe have helped, you know, uh, on, on the margins moving along. Um, and, uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, Michigan's interesting because they're a state I know about that's considering not only some form of delivery reform, but also maybe some kind of an open container uh, reform. Open containers are a little bit tricky. It, it depends on the state a lot, but also on the locality. It's a weird double layering of, of law. So some states say that, hey, municipalities can decide for themselves if they want to have some open container laws. Other states will just proactively say no municipality can have any kind of an open container law in the state. And so uh, it'll depend on the state, but, but uh, ones like Michigan that have that prohibition may consider flipping it. And that doesn't mean that everywhere in Michigan you'll be able to drink a a beer outside, it would then require the additional step of the municipality uh, making that a, a legal reality. 
Um, but yeah, you know, there, there's been a bunch of states. So uh, the last one I'll mention, just it's just kind of interesting. This is a little bit different than what we've been talking about is Kentucky in the midst of COVID pass uh, a, a pretty robust uh, uh, shipping bill that allows, we've been talking a lot about kind of uh, on-demand delivery. So a driver comes and, and delivers it from point A to point B, but for longer distance stuff, Kentucky allows, uh, is now allows distilleries and breweries wineries in the state to ship directly to uh, customers uh, and, uh, and consumers. Uh, and, and they actually also have a provision that, again, if another state has one of those reciprocal agreements we talked about, that they can also ship in state to Kentucky uh, uh, consumers and, and, and vice versa. So uh, that's uh, another vein of this long distance shipment could be uh, uh, something that gets more traction. I, I, I've seen more emphasis on kind of the local deliveries for now. But uh, Kentucky's worth mentioning. They, that bill was pending for a while, but I think it got a lot of sea legs once COVID happened, and everyone's like, "Whoa, you know, we need to rethink about how people might be able to get to get alcohol." So it's just a handful. It's it's happening all across the country. We try to do our best to track as many of them as we can on uh, on our uh, website drinksreform.org. But we're I'm sure we're not perfect. It's moving so fast right now; it's hard to keep up. So. Yeah, there's definitely a ton of activity. Um, so I'm going to take a little break from chatting with Jarrett. Um, I want to, I was going to say remind everybody, but I think I neglected to say this at the top. If you have particular questions for Jarrett, either overall regarding the landscape or particular issues that you're running into in, into your location, please put them in the chat window and I will share those with Jarrett as we continue our conversation. I did want to take a little break like we usually do and, uh, and feature a little bit what we're doing here at Distillery 291, who we are and what we're doing. Um, and then uh, a couple minutes with LibDib as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael Myers to do a little bit of introduction to 291 for those who aren't familiar and any additional thoughts that we have on kind of what we're doing in our COVID environment. And there is Michael. Hi. So I'm Michael Myers, founding distiller, CEO of 291. Um, we here at 291 Colorado Whiskey make a Western whiskey. I set out to make a, a Colorado whiskey that was big, bold, and beautiful like the state of Colorado. Um, we make a bourbon and a rye uh, from grain to glass um, from scratch. And um, we've grown very well. Um, we're starting to grow out of state along with LibDib as a distribution. And um, it's going really well. We've won many awards um, for our whiskey. We've won world's best rye whiskey uh, in 2018 and many other San Francisco and different awards like that. But um, we are uh, expanding this year. We, we are in 7,500 square feet now, moving to somewhere about 25,000 square feet so that we can produce more whiskey and get it out of the state of Colorado. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Thank you, um, And now I'm gonna shoot it over to uh, Philip, our VP of Business Development for his thoughts on kind of what's going on these days in the COVID environment here. I am excited for my two nine one more thing. Oh, right thank now. you. I always forget to That's say okay. that. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> two ninety one more thing. Um, my two nine one more thing. Um, I think for for today, you know, we've been talking a lot about the some of the to go cocktails and the regulations and. Um, you know, our liquor store partners, um, a lot of your reps also deal with your on-premise um, people who are making those to-go cocktails. I think it would be a great time for you to partner with a restaurant and figure out how to do an end cap and, you know, how do I make that to-go cocktail at home? Um, so that's always really uh, just a cool uh, tidbit for our liquor store partners is partnering with your local restaurants and figuring out how to, you know, end cap a 291 uh, Old Fashioned with a restaurant or 291 Boulevard A, different cocktails that they're going to go and making that end cap a, a cocktail to go so your people can make it at home, right? Um, and we've made some, uh, a lot of changes here during COVID um, with how we've been dealing with our resellers. Of course, our partners with uh, LibDib and um, making uh, the access to their platform really available. Um, a lot of times in dealing with liquor store buyers, I know that I've heard, oh yeah, 291, I forget who you're distributed with. Um, who, who are you working with in all these different markets? So what we did uh, at the beginning of COVID here was we created a buy 291, and then you scroll down to the reseller uh, capture thing, 
click on that and it's going to bring up a map of the United States and all states that were distributed in. You click your state that's highlighted gray um, and that'll bring you directly to LibDiv's platform in those states. It'll bring you to um, RNDC's platforms in the states that we use RNDC. Um, so I think that's really a cool way that we've tried to make it easier for you to purchase. You can always reach out to any of your reps if you know them. Uh, you can always reach out to myself, Philip at distillery291.com uh, or at my email, um, just so you can uh, have direct access to us, easy communication. We want to help you through this time as well. And as we move into the new normal and how to buy 291, uh, work with 291 and work with your partners. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. No problem. Okay, uh, so that's the 291 more thing for today. Cheryl, I've got you unmuted. Do you want to give a LibDib lowdown sure. input for today? Well, this has been, thank you again for having us or having me. Um, and, you know, Jared, it's, it's so interesting. And you must be so crazy busy right now about every single one of these new regulations. While I was on the phone with you, there was, you know, my family owns a winery here in California and I was watching a regulation came through from the ABC like today because they were planning on opening the tasting room with this weekend and they had to have food. Well, now they don't have to have food. Like that happened in the last 12 hours. So normally this kinds of stuff, you know, alcohol reform takes, you know, weeks, months, years, and now it's happening in hours. So um, I, I do not envy you. I know everyone right now, you know, kind of in this COVID environment is always saying, God, I'm working harder than ever just to keep up. So I'm sure you're the same way I am as well. You know, we're, again, we're a distributor. We're, we're doing things differently in that we really help the small producers and um, really get to market. So we think that, um, there's a there's a, even more of an interest in in smaller production products when it comes to, you know, people wanting to support support small business, wanting to support family owned, um, wanting to have a connection with their with what they're eating and drinking, and and that's really what we do. So, um, for anyone who's interested and, and wants to purchase two nine one as well in the states that we operate with them, um, just libdib.com. Um, it's free to open an account. It's uh, super easy to get set up, and um, we have thousands and thousands of products across the United States. So anyways, thanks again, Murray. Um, love seeing you, Michael and Philip, and um, great to meet you, Jared, and look forward to the rest of the session. That's great. Thank you, Cheryl. I actually wanted to throw back a question to you if I could, because, yeah. you know, as we're sitting here talking about the regulatory environment and, you know, LibDib is a huge important partner to us in distributing our products. And so I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts because you are balancing kind of being a forerunner in the industry mm -hmm. with making sure that everything is done obviously on a fully compliant basis. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of love to hear your thoughts on how you walk that walk. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, trends. It, we have lots of lawyers who tell us what to do. Um, when we, especially every state as, as anyone who's in the operating within the three tier system or with any direct to consumer, every state is different and every state has different rules and regulations. They have different tax rates. They have different ways of reporting. And they have different, um, what we really pay attention to is at rest laws. So, you know, while we're up, op we operate different in that we don't hold a ton of inventory in any one market. And even sometimes one case or one bottle at a time, that's how we can represent all of these different products will come in as, as the, we get the demand from the retailer or the restaurant, but it, sometimes it has to hit a dock. Sometimes it has to sit there. Sometimes it doesn't. And that's what our platform does. And that's how we built it because, you know, it's really the only platform out there that was built, you know, entirely for a distributor and entirely for each state regulation. Um, so we took all of that into consideration, paid a lot of money in legal fees and compliance fees and all of that, but um, feel very good about what we've done because hopefully it'll, it'll change the industry and make it easier and more efficient and faster to get to market with, with all of these different products and innovations that are coming out. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks. We are thrilled to be partners with you and glad you're here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's uh, open it back up with Jarrett. And Jarrett, I guess to start, I saw you nodding your head a lot as Cheryl was chatting. So I'd just like to get your kind of reaction to, to you know, what you were hearing as she was, as she was saying what she was doing. Yeah, well, I, uh, at rest laws are, are really interesting. Cheryl probably knows uh, more about them than I do, but uh, it's it's definitely um, uh, something that you see in states and for a 
I guess a really summary if people aren't familiar, probably most people are on this call, but it, it's just a requirement as she said that, that the beer needs to, or the product needs to come at rest somewhere and sit somewhere for a little while before it can go on to uh, the delivery. So uh, I was just nodding my head out of interest uh, in that. But the other thing that, that I thought was really interesting that, that Cheryl, uh, Cheryl touched on that I wish I would have mentioned earlier when speaking about the different facets you're seeing with these uh, these laws. Um, uh, I've seen it most in the delivery context. It's really interesting that uh, in the uh, on-premise winery uh, context, it came up, but a, a food requirement. Uh, and, and so we've seen uh, an all, almost all the bills I've seen involving, um, and, and most of the, deli uh, the emergency orders I've seen involving uh, to-go cocktails from at least restaurants have required a food component. Uh, which is interesting. Some of the uh, the uh, retail delivery ones, so grocery store delivery, I've seen them also. You know, if you, with your groceries, you can get uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of alcohol, but you can't just order a six pack. Uh, and, and so that's going to be something to to continue to watch too. I uh, I think that um, I understand why those laws exist. Although it's funny, a lot of this um, mentality of food needing to uh, legally having some link to alcohol, um, you know, really does come from. Uh, uh, kind of at least prohibition era sentiments, I would say, although it's not exactly the same. Now, Virginia uh, is one example, has what's called the, a food beverage ratio for, for restaurants and, that, and for their on-premise uh, sales, actually, they need to have a certain amount of food sales to offset their alcohol sales. So they can't just be like operating a high-end cocktail bar without offering some food. And so I think that's kind of transporting itself over to the delivery space with, with restaurants um, and, and, and so I understand kind of why it's happening. And obviously it's important to enjoy spirits uh, and drinks responsibly. Um, I, I think and hope everyone on this call would, would agree with that. Um, and food can obviously help play a, a role in that, but uh, it'll be interesting, you know, again, consumers are used to kind of just on demand getting whatever product. And, and, and if you need to buy extra floss, for example, you don't have to also, you know, buy a toothbrush to go with it. And so it'll be interesting um, if, with uh, alcohol, if there will be a move towards allowing just delivery, for example, of alcohol without the food requirement. And, and, it, and it can put a lot of burdens on businesses. You know, not every winery has or is set up or has any interest in having uh, food service, for example, yeah. um, or uh, restaurants uh, in Richmond, for, in, uh, for example, there's some really great high-end cocktail bars and uh, there to go uh, delivery privileges for, for alcohol during uh, COVID. They had to serve food. They do serve food, but like they like they'll have like a sub, you know, again, to meet the Virginia food, food beverage ratio. And so, you know, do they, do they have an undying like desire to make that sub? I don't know. Maybe they'd rather just, uh, you know, be able to sell the, the cocktails, for example, or just be able to deliver those. So that's another really important uh, thing that's going to continue to uh, be debated in these bills that I, I didn't mention earlier. So I was, uh, astute point uh, by uh, by Cheryl. So. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting because there was wineries here that were just like, okay, we'll just get a food truck. Does that work? And it's not even necessarily on the same ticket. It's 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 super bizarre. But the, California just changed it. I mean, we have a huge wine industry, obviously, um, and I'm sure you know we have a kind of liberal laws, anyways, compared to most other states. But it'll be really interesting to see kind of what happens as we continue with COVID and as we, you know, deal with kind of like exactly this new normal. Yeah. Yeah. If they did it in another state, they might uh, be able to get away with it. But California has got a lot of wine, wine, wine makers. So. <laughs> a lot of wineries. And there was a lawsuit that brought this up. Like one of the wineries in Napa, um, you know, was suing. So, and that's why they changed it. So yeah. super yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. fascinating. So, um, Let's uh, let's go back to something that you talked about uh, in some of your earlier comments, Garrett. You were talking about some of the interstate uh, applications here. And so I wanted to see if a um, couple different things. One is, can you talk a little bit more about what you saw in Kentucky? And do you think that is a one-off because Kentucky is such a unique, unusual situation? Or do you think that's something that can translate more? That's question number one. And then I have a follow-up. Yeah, well, I think the, the story actually starts uh, pre-Kentucky. Um, it, it really goes back even to, to uh, you could argue probably to 2005 even, um, when uh, the Supreme Court heard the uh, famous or at least famous in uh, alcohol circles case, a uh, Granholm case out of Michigan that uh, allowed 
uh, or it was about whether wineries uh, could ship across state lines from one state to another. A lot of states had rules that said only our wineries in state can ship to our consumers, not one from another state. Uh, and so that, that was challenged. Uh, it was a constitutional challenge. It went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the court held that, uh, that, that those laws uh, were a form of uh, economic discrimination, uh, basically is, is how it was uh, uh, characterized, um, where they were uh, uh, kind of unduly burdening interstate commerce between two states if you preferenced your in-staters versus your out-of-staters in that way. Uh, and, and so fast forward in time since 2005, um, we've seen wine shipments really take off, right? I mean, there's a lot of wine clubs around. Almost every state, I think now, it's like 40-something states allow wineries to ship in and out across state borders. Uh, but you, uh, you don't have that, right, with, uh, with beer as much or uh, hard spirits. Uh, it's, it's only a handful of states that, that allow that in and out of their uh, borders, interstate shipment of those products and also retail stores uh, is important. So a wine store, uh, actually the way that follow-up decisions to Grand Home were uh, handed down, lower court decisions, uh, wine, you could be a wine store, but you still, uh, you can't ship interstate often cases. So uh, you're a winery, a producer, you can, if you're a different type of licensee, a retailer or a wine store, for example, um, you cannot uh, ship interstate. Uh, and so that all uh, led to a lot of follow-up litigation and people arguing for, for about a decade. And then uh, last year, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, granted a cert, which means they agreed to hear another case uh, involving uh, in versus out-of-state uh, breakdown of, uh, of the drinks industry. It wasn't a shipping case, but it was a, a Tennessee law that said to operate a retail store in Tennessee you had to be a resident of the state of Tennessee for 10 years, uh, essentially, before, before you could uh, open the store and hold a license. Um, and they struck that down and again said that that was uh, in form of economic discrimination against uh, people that had recently moved to Tennessee or out-of-staters. Uh, so what does that have to do with uh, uh, shipping? Well, uh, again, it kind of, the, the, the court's language in it suggested that um, these kind of shipping restrictions might also run into trouble because, again, they were... Uh, doing kind of discriminating economically against out-of-state interests and burdening interstate commerce. Um, and, and, and so that's, that was kind of the context we were in. And the great question was, would any states kind of uh, maybe see kind of some of the changing winds that were coming from the Supreme Court on interstate alcohol shipments and uh, passing any proactive laws about it? And Kentucky was the answer. So uh, Kentucky uh, decided to do so. Of course, uh, Kentucky, like California is to wine, Kentucky is uh, to uh, distilled spirits in many ways, of course, because of the uh, 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 bourbon uh, landscape there. And so I, I think that a lot of the producers there had an interest in being able to ship directly to consumers. And, uh, and, and the law passed. So uh, now in Kentucky, it's not just wineries, but it's also uh, producers of distilled spirits and, and beer that can ship to consumers. Um, but, you know, it again applies to Kentucky, as I said earlier. So that doesn't mean that uh, it'll apply to every state. Um, and uh, it doesn't apply. I, I still can't go online and order Buffalo Trace and get it shipped to Virginia, right? Because we don't have a reciprocal, reciprocal agreement with Kentucky. So um, it'll be interesting to see if that starts percolating up more. I think that Kentucky, um, uh, you know, places like Kentucky and California are looked at a little bit as industry or policy leaders when it comes to the alcohol landscape because of, uh, because of who they are, because of the traditions they have uh, in their respective beverage categories. So I, I could see more states giving it a look uh, now that Kentucky's done it. And also now that uh, COVID's happened and has really changed uh, you know, people's summer plans, if they go up every summer uh, to visit uh, in, a, in a different state and they always get their favorite beer up there, they might not be able to do that this summer. So they might start asking, hey, why can't I just get that IPA shipped to me? Or why can't I just get the, the bourbon or, or rye shipped to me? So yeah, I think that's something that uh, is coming and it's not just because of COVID. I think more places will be considering it now uh, just because of some of the Supreme Court uh, movement that, that we've seen. Um, and, and where all that will go there, there, but still there's been cases going both ways. So uh, uh, there was a, another follow-up case involving uh, retailers in, in Michigan that have said that even despite the Supreme court cases that, that uh, they're not convinced that, that the law requires interstate uh, shipments of all uh, spirit types. So there's going to continue to be a lot of, um, a lot of debate about it. Um, a lot of concern about how it impacts the three-tiered system, whether it erodes it too much um, and people that, 
uh, that work in the three-tiered system uh, will, will perhaps be leery uh, of it or, or depend upon the three-tiered system will perhaps be leery of it. So it's very much to be determined, but uh, it's, it's definitely something to keep an eye on, I think, uh, in, in the months and weeks ahead. So do you think um, direct-to-consumer you know, has, has the type of promise that ends up being you know, a, a new category, if you will, within the way uh, drinks are available within the industry? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that it will, um, what form it will take will be interesting. I mean, I don't, um, you know, many people have kind of called the, uh, uh, referred to the idea of going from retailers to consumers as kind of the fourth tier that adds on, you know, between the other three tiers. And whether it takes that form or whether there's more direct from producer down to consumer level, uh, I think, you know, will, will depend on the state and remains to be seen. But uh, I do think, um, as we've talked about, that it's going to be hard to fully uh, put the toothpaste back in, in, in the tube or unhammer the nail, whatever analogy you want to use uh, with this, because uh, there is inter interest in it. And I think that it's very tough when we allow all these other categories of goods to be uh, delivered directly to your door, why alcohol is different. And sure, alcohol has some uh, reasons that you might want caution around it uh, compared to, you know, a piece of paper or something like that. But also we, we allow things like pharmaceuticals and we have for a long time to be shipped directly uh, to people's doors. And so we, there, there are other contexts where we allow, um, we allow the shipment of highly regulated goods to be delivered directly to people in, in, in some forms. So I think that, I think that there's going to be a greater push for it uh, and, and it'll probably be led by the consumer uh, again because they tend to tend to not only dictate how uh, and what producers do and who they're trying to appeal to but they also tend to dictate how public policy changes over time because consumers is another word for voters so <laughs> there you go so i do have a question from john he's asking about the challenge oh well this i sure see this from a 291 perspective he's talking about the challenges related to tastings during COVID-19. With small independent products, we need to have our products tasted so that consumer can understand the quality of the products. Tastings are on hold for in-store promotions. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that coming from a regulatory perspective or otherwise. Yeah, I, um, that's uh, in the pre-COVID uh, era, which seems so, so long ago. Um, that's something that uh, I, I wrote quite a bit about it. There's actually still states that have, uh, Virginia being one of them, Oregon, uh, no, Washington State uh, being another, that have, uh, mostly it's in the context of distilleries, uh, have limits on how much product you can sample when you go to a distillery. Again, even in the pre-COVID era, um, you know, two ounces, three ounces, for example. Um, and meanwhile, you can go to you know, a brewery down the street and have as many Imperial IPAs as you want, right? And those are, uh, you know, pretty strong uh, to these days, uh, depending uh, on, on what, uh, what brewery you're at. Um, but uh, but that, that's been uh, an important thing that I've tried to emphasize because as, as the, uh, John, the questioner mentioned, that's really an important critical piece for the small scale uh, craft uh, beverage producers, right? They, they're not buying Super Bowl ads, right? Like uh, some of the huge guys are uh, to get their, their word out on their products. They're having people taste it and they're having kind of word of mouth, uh, guerrilla marketing, if you will, going from one place to another and people talking, hey, you know, 291's got this really great rye, like you should go check it out. And then, okay, fine, I'll go. And then I want to taste it when I'm there. And oh, darn, that's really good. I want to buy, you know, a couple bottles of it. Uh, as, as you you all know better than I do. Um, and so it is really important. And uh, in, the, in the COVID uh, context, it's something that I think policymakers should be thinking about. I mean, I don't, uh, I, I think that if there's real reasons that, that uh, health and safety dictates that tasting should not be done, then uh, we should see those. But, uh, you know, I don't see off the top of my head, um, and I'm not an, uh, a scientist or an epidemiologist, but off the top of my head, I don't see any reason why things like, uh, um, you know, plastic uh, uh, cups or, or shot glasses or something wouldn't work, for example, for, for a taste um, and, uh, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, doable, I guess, or something that would still protect, uh, protect health and safety, but also allow people to, to taste products. Um, uh, you know, breweries are, are the same way um, uh, with things like growlers, right? So should you be able to refill growlers or should you move towards more, plat you know, some other kind of version? Well, the states that have said you can't refill, they're at least letting you do things like uh, 
letting uh, breweries get uh, plastic uh, kind of you know disposable growlers. Um, and yeah, the price might be a little bit higher, but the consumer is oftentimes willing in this situation to understand that and adapt. So yeah, I think it's important and it's something that uh, policymakers shouldn't lose sight of because uh, it, it really uh, matters for, for the people that are making the, the kinds of craft beverages uh, that, that you all and others are, are making. And oftentimes those come at, at uh, understandably higher price points than some of the macro produced stuff. That's because they taste better in often cases. Um, not that there isn't good macro products out there, there really is. But, uh, you know, the people that are buying them tend to really care about what they taste like, right? So uh, it's important to give them a, a channel to do so. I totally agree with all of that. Um, so let's, let's kind of make sure we're coming back to frame everything from a timing perspective. Because I, I kind of have the impression, listen, there's a window of opportunity in here in terms of implementing changes. And I'd like your thoughts on kind of what that window looks like, how long you think it is, what the people in the industry should be doing to try to hit that window if you know there's particular agendas and, and changes in legislation that we'd like to, that we'd like to see. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. One thing to keep in mind is that I think uh, uh, people probably that aren't as embedded in, in the policy world as uh, me and some of my colleagues might miss is that a lot of state legislators aren't even in session right now, right? So uh, we can sit here and talk all day long about, you know, pass this, pass that, you know, this relief bill, this alcohol reform bill, and they might not even be in session. Uh, a lot of them uh, uh, are not. Some of them are starting to come back. The ones that are starting to come back, they might literally be doing uh, only things related to getting their budget passed because they weren't able to do that in the spring. And that's like an emergency issue. And if you come to them with anything, it's not budget related, they're gonna tell you to go away. So uh, it just very much depends. Other states have, uh, well, one thing I'll mention just to back up is that some states only have very limited legislative seasons. So uh, states like Georgia will meet for a couple months in the spring um, each year and not the rest of the year. Um, you know, many states like that have part-time legislatures. Um, I, I can't remember if it's South Dakota or North Dakota that um, I think the legislature meets like every other year, actually, uh, interestingly, and, and instead of every year. And, and again, it's part-time legislatures. They have other jobs. They're not just doing it full-time like Congress is. But then there's, there's states that do meet year-round, Massachusetts, California, uh, for example. Um, so it's really going to depend on the state when this stuff can be pushed. But uh, the window of opportunity, a lot of this may sort itself out next spring, counterintuitively, right? We're right in the middle of this uh, COVID uh, uh, kind of new normal and, and how are things going to change. But uh, a lot of legislatures will either not be considering these subjects or not want to really turn to them until that 2021 uh, spring legislative season. Usually the spring kind of is, is the busiest time for a, a lot of legislation being uh, introduced. Um, and that'll be post also the, the 2020 elections. Um, you know, legislatures uh, tend to not love to do a lot of big push stuff right before they're up for election. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, many reasons for that, of course. But uh, that's another reason that a lot of this may sort itself out in 2021. So there's going to be movement now, but the window of opportunity, I think, will be uh, the next year or two, not just the next two months is, is how I would frame it. That's great input. So um, I want to wrap things up by giving you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you're working on and the book you're doing and, and maybe tease us a little bit with some of the oddball legislative uh, stories or instances that you uh, that you're looking at right now. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, mentioning uh, my book. Yeah, it's, um, uh, as you said, it's called uh, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink. And, and the idea is kind of just to look at America's alcohol landscape. Um, <clears throat> it uh, is, is an area of the law that, uh, you know, now we are in the 100th anniversary of Prohibition starting and over 85 years since it ended. Um, but we have so many uh, um, legal uh, hangovers, if you'll pardon uh, the pun, uh, from uh, prohibition um, that we're still living with in, in the alcohol landscape. So, uh, you know, silly things. Uh, Indiana is, is, is a favorite example. Gas stations there can uh, only sell uh, beer at room temperature. They're actually not allowed to put it in a refrigerator. Uh, as uh, basic as that seems, you can do it uh, everywhere else. Uh, places like Utah still have requirements that bartenders have to mix cocktails behind partitions uh, or, or walls so people can't see them. Um, there's some modifications on that now, but it's just still a rule there uh, for the large part. Um, and, and so it really kind of looks at that and, and tries to provide a humorous uh, 
uh, it, kind of take on it. And it's an effort to kind of raise awareness of, hey, we had this whole you know, section of the economy that shows great promise. Some of the greatest job growth we've seen has been from uh, uh, producers of alcohol, craft producers, uh, uh, you know, cooperage, uh, you know, people that are making barrels, uh, people that are making stills. We have all this wonderful job growth that is, you know, probably not what it could be uh, because we have some of these rules that were from a, a long, long time ago that may not always make sense in our modern economy. So uh, it's just trying to kind of create awareness for that and also have a little bit of fun uh, doing so because there's a lot of stuff to kind of uh, sarcastically poke fun at uh, in, in the alcohol uh, landscape. Uh, probably everyone has their favorite weird quirky law from, from their state that they like to talk about. So uh, it's an effort to do that. And, uh, and I think it's something that's going to get increasing attention, not just because of uh, COVID, but um, it, it really relates to so many things. Um, I was uh, watching a couple of uh, uh, seminars uh, recently uh, with uh, minority owned distillers, for example, and talking about, um, uh, you know, in the context of all the, the racial injustice issues that, that uh, our country is grappling with right now. And, uh, you know, really a lot of um, the minority owned businesses are really emphasizing the fact that they oftentimes don't have as much capital when they're starting up. Uh, and therefore the regulations really bite, really like make a huge impact on them. Um, and uh, Chris Denord from Denord Spirits and, and some others have talked uh, quite a bit about, about that. And so I think that um, it, it's an issue that is not going away, kind of how to modernize and, and make our alcohol landscape make more sense uh, in the modern era. And people are going to disagree on how to do that. Of course, uh, you know, different stakeholders will have different thoughts. Uh, but uh, I think that it's, it's something that's very much ripe for consideration. So it's uh, that, that's why uh, we try to think and write about it and, uh, and doing stuff like this, I think is really important because it, it kind of gets people together uh, in a, a virtual room now. It's not a real room, unfortunately, but a virtual room to talk about the stuff and think about how it might be able to improve. So. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. So I know we're just past the top of the hour. If you could real quickly let people know how they should reach you and read your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, drinksreform.org is the easiest. Uh, it's just uh, drinksreform.org. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tracking of different stuff going on there and uh, you can get in touch with us through that and uh, all the usual channels. But uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, everyone's time tuning in and I uh, think thanks most of all to the hosts and not only for this, but for this great series you all are putting on. I think it's uh, important and certainly timely. So awesome. thank you so much, Jared. Enjoyed having you. Thought it was a great discussion. Uh, just to let everybody know, we've got one more session ahead of us. The uh, wrap it, We'll wrap it up next week with Corey Rellis, the CEO of Drizzly. We'll obviously be talking about uh, deliveries within the industry. So uh, very timely and very topical, I think. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everybody next week. I want to thank Cheryl again from LibDib. Thank Jared for spending time with us and going through everything on the regulatory front. We look forward to seeing everybody next Thursday at the same time. And uh, please, everyone, still stay safe and take care of one another.